Uh, hello again. Uh, so in recent times, the world civilization has faced two existential threats, a nuclear war and global warming. And it's interesting to compare the reactions to these, especially in terms of the public and the popular imagery that uh, these two uh, quite different threats have generated. And the first thing you notice, and perhaps the most important thing, is that nuclear war has a very long and rich heritage of imagery, which climate change actually asks. It goes back to the radium age, which is the early 20th century, when radium and radioactivity were discovered and provoked a great deal of enthusiasm. You could get uh, uh, drink radiated water, you could uh, have a radium heater, you could have radium chocolate, you could brush your teeth with radioactive toothpaste. Uh, and there was a comparable a great uh, deal of excitement about uh, these things in the media. Uh, radium is restoring health to thousands. This was correct. Radium was quite effective against certain types of cancers, but also uh, Ray believes radium an elixir of life. Uh, people went quite beyond what was possible with radium. People were also aware uh, by the 1920s of the harms that radioactivity could do, particularly because of the radium dial painters. They painted luminescent paint on uh, watch dials. They tipped the brushes with their lips, as instructed, and they got jaw cancer. And then, again, besides the real dangers, there were perceived dangers, Inventor Hyde's secret of death ray. Death rays became very popular uh, media meme, not only in science fiction, but in the general media. Uh, this, of course, is the uh, meme, the tradition of the mad scientist. We mustn't think that people have only criticized scientists in modern, uh, in recent times. There's an old tradition of scientists as being dangerous people, which goes back actually to shamans and to witches, with their secret potions and uh, poisons and so on. And by the 1930s, this became pop, well, even the 1920s, but especially in the 1930s, there were some very popular movies which featured uh, bad scientists with their terrible rays. Uh, there's a lot of Freudism in here, uh, the uh, authority or father figure, the helpless victim being irradiated and so forth. I won't get into that, but you can easily imagine it. Here's another one, The Invisible Ray, starring Boris Karloff with Bela Lugosi. Uh, destruction to all he touched or looked upon. He glowed in the dark, perhaps the origin of the glowing in the dark figure. Went around touching people with his hand. Here's Boris Karloff uh, at his worst. Again, the figure of the dangerous, uh, indeed mad scientist. Uh, not only going around like that, but also the possibility of setting off a chain reaction that would blow up the world. The idea of the mad scientist, the bad scientist, or simply the careless scientist who would destroy everything. Now this was of course only one aspect of the image of the scientist and of science. Uh, more common, more popular was the image of the good science, good technology, the atomic power plant that could be foreseen for the future. This is a 1930s image. Uh, here's the future as perceived by H.G. Wells and uh, put in a movie in 1936, Things to Come. Uh, the atomic powered future powered by clean, uh, ubiquitous, uh, cheap atomic energy. It kind of reminds me of the inside of a Hyatt hotel. Uh, but this future would come only after uh, an atomic war, after what uh, uh, Wells coining a phrase in 1913 called the atomic bomb. This too was portrayed in the movie as a horrible atomic catastrophe civilization smashed back to its foundations uh, before the coming of the new atomic age uh, could take in place. And then of course came World War II in 1945 and the devastation that was predicted. This is actually from the Tokyo fire raid, much more devastating than Hiroshima. But by, 19, by the end of 1945, after Hiroshima, it was as if all the technological horrors of the war could be uh, incorporated, could be symbolized by nuclear weapons and, of course, by nuclear scientists. Well, this brings us to the nuclear age. And once again, there was also the positive side of science. Uh, there was a lot of thought about what great things would come now that the nuclear energy was liberated. We would have those atomic power plants, we'd have those atomic powered, uh, atomic powered cars and uh, ships and airplanes, uh, that we would have atomic golf balls which you could easily find in the rough using your Geiger counter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, this is, this, this is real. Uh, but uh, once again, uh, because of the dangers of nuclear war, the negative side tended to dominate. 
uh, Godzilla is uh, easily recognizable as the mad scientist's monster transformed, also immediately recognized as not just awakened by an atomic bomb, but as symbolizing the atomic bomb going around stomping Tokyo while fire, while um, air raid sirens uh, came off and so forth. And indeed, uh, the gigantism, uh, people talked uh, about making larger vegetables uh, by irradiating things, and of course, the whole issue of giantism in a very scary and very widely seen, very widely credited movie, uh, them, the giant radioactive ants, and then of course, along came giant crabs, giant scorpions, giant grasshoppers, uh, you name it. Uh, on a more realistic basis, there was the fallout uh, that would come from atomic bombs. Once hydrogen bombs came along, it was no use just uh, hiding under your desk. You had to have a fallout shelter, and there were uh, rather bizarre public debates about what to do. If your neighbors came, should you hit them with your shovel? Should you have a rifle? Uh, and this uh, easily verged over into science fiction also. The image of the person coming out from the fallout shelter and finding himself in a devastated world, if not indeed as in this uh, uh, Twilight Zone thing, being the last man on Earth. Uh, this uh, was the meme of the apocalypse. Again, the whole total destruction of the world through nuclear energy, through the carelessness of nuclear scientists. And also at the same time, uh, nuclear uh, weapons had fallout uh, poison, and this was particularly a problem because these tests were being conducted in the atmosphere. So there was a widespread and increasing protest against nuclear tests in particular. So the, uh, uh, the, there was, of course, a very uh, powerful protest movement which uh, came close to capturing political parties, although it never quite did uh, in Western Europe and in the United States, uh, which increasingly became oriented against the fallout from uh, atomic bomb tests. So here's, uh, it's culminated in the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, after which we have here Kennedy and Khrushchev saying, let's get a uh, lock for this thing. You see again the nuclear war presented as the mad scientist's monster attempting to escape, and they did get a lock, at least in the public opinion, because they put the nuclear tests underground, so there was no more fallout to uh, protest against, and quite rapidly, all the measures that we have for nuclear uh, attention to nuclear fear disappeared. The number of newspaper articles, the number of books, the number of movies, they all underwent a precipitous decline. Now, in the public opinion polls, people no longer mention nuclear war as a salient question. Now, if you ask them, are you worried about nuclear war, they'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm worried about that. But it was not the first question, the first problem that came to mind. And polls. This, of course, is an example of denial in the classic sense of a problem that is perceived as being perhaps so frightening that you're just not going to think about it at all. And we have uh, responses to polls where people said, oh, that's too frightening. I'm not going to think about it. Uh, they literally said that. And, of course, there was also a strong government campaign uh, for uh, promoting the positive uses of nuclear energy, atoms for peace, nuclear ships, and so forth, actually built nuclear ships all of which uh, were designed and to some extent did uh, serve to allay public fears. Uh, the medical uses, which in fact uh, we must remember uh, medicine has saved many more lives than nuclear energy has ever cost. Nevertheless, this kind of image of the child being irradiated could not help but evoke more primitive ideas. Uh, and uh, as nuclear reactors were built, uh, increasingly they came to evoke uh, the ideas of uh, the possibility of nuclear explosion. Nuclear waste, in particular, uh, reminded people of all the problems that had been brought up about fallout from nuclear weapons. It was, once again, the image of the uh, scientists poisoning the world. And there were real genuine problems with nuclear waste. Nuclear wastes were badly mishandled by the Atomic Energy Commission, in particular, which was about the only uh, commission in the world that even people knew about what they were doing. Uh, and th the result was, uh, the result not only the mishandling of nuclear wastes, but of very poor mishandling, uh, in fact, outright lies about fallout from nuclear bomb tests, and the general distrust that existed of nuclear scientists. And the result was that this trust, which was so important for the Atomic Energy Commission, for others, began to fade away. And so the protest movement revived. The same people who had protested against nuclear fallout now began to protest against radioactivity 
from nuclear reactors. And then, of course, came the Three Mile Island accident, and nuclear uh, energy uh, largely came to a halt in the United States. And so did the protest movement against nuclear reactors, because there wasn't any more any expansion of nuclear reactors to protest against. Besides, there was the revival of the Cold War. Uh, Reagan widely perceived as being uh, very aggressive in the military sense and undertook uh, to, uh, and at the same time, the leadership of the Soviet Union was very backward and aggressive. And the result was uh, uh, a very rapid revival of the public fears of nuclear war. And this was reflected again in the media, but now it was quite different. The media, uh, these uh, giant radioactive monsters and so forth might symbolize nuclear war or the person emerging as the last man out of, after nuclear war, but these movies didn't actually show nuclear war. This was quite different in the 1980s, particularly a very widely seen and extremely uh, affecting uh, television and then movie called The Day After, in which showed ordinary people in ordinary situations uh, responding to nuclear war. These, these kind of images uh, simply had not been seen until the 1980s, and they affected everybody, including Reagan. Uh, uh, along with this came a revival of the anti-nuclear movement, and it did come close to capturing political party in the United States. And the response uh, to this, as well as to nuclear winter and to other things that were uh, part of this whole uh, movement, was the detente between uh, Reagan and Gorbachev after which, once again, public attention to nuclear energy as a salient issue simply dropped out of sight, and all of, the, uh, all, all of this imagery and all of the uh, fears largely went away, while remaining uh, as uh, protests against nuclear wastes, protests against nuclear reactors, wherever they were proposed. Uh, and this phase came to end quite recently with the Fukushima accident, which has certainly put a halt now to uh, nuclear concerns by and large, and has, uh, in that sense, uh, opened up a space for people to protest to devote their energies to global warming. So what about global warming? Well, here's a fairly typical image. I think we've already seen a few like this uh, that the media present when they want to talk about the carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. Of course, the problem is carbon dioxide and methane are invisible, so this is the best they can give. And as uh, I mentioned earlier, it's a little ambiguous whether this is an image of danger or of progress. And if it is an image of danger, that's a very familiar one going back to smog and so forth and is not an image that is particularly impressive. So if people seek impressive images, they go for the, uh, well, not the exploding Earth, but the apocalyptic image of the Earth being destroyed, a kind of a science fictional image. And in fact, there have been science fiction presentations the day after tomorrow. Uh, name that almost sounds familiar, uh, presenting all these kinds of horrible things that would happen. Uh, we saw earlier an image of the uh, drowned city. This is another common image. This is from uh, Al Gore's film, of course. And again, it seems it's, it's a far future presentation. Indeed, it was used in Spielberg Kubrick's film AI uh, to symbolize a very distant future, uh, the kind of thing that uh, might happen, but uh, who knows exactly when. Uh, hurricanes have been widely used, and this has uh, had the problem that hurricanes can't really be uh, reliably attributed to global warming. And then the other uh, very common image, of course, is the image of a scientist or a spokesperson. And if you Google global warming, if you go for, to Google Images and Google global warming, you'll find all these things, and you'll find a lot of images of Al Gore. Now, the issue was politicized before Al Gore, but he's been seized upon uh, by the right as an image of global warming. And so we have cartoons like this, which always appear in the winter, uh, the very cold day in Chicago. And Al Gore is saying, wow, can you imagine how cold it would be right now without global warming? So this, again, is a very typical type of image. Finally, if you Google the uh, images of global warming, you'll find a lot of images like this. You'll find this image and many more like this uh, of uh, rather paradoxically, global warming presented in terms of ice. Now, this is accurate, of course, because that's where most of it happens, but nevertheless, it's a rather remote thing. Then the icon, the other icon of global warming is the polar bear. This is from a t-shirt, spare the air, save a bear, walk to school. Uh, the problem here, of course, is that polar bears are vicious predators <laughs> and not necessarily uh, the ideal image for it. Now, there are other images that people have used and that studies have shown are preferable, and that 
Yeah, okay, I'm almost done, actually. Uh, and which, uh, uh, like the day after uh, movie, bring the image of the global warming home. And these are the kind of things that I like to use in my things. Things that can, now we know, fairly reliably be tied to global warming as having happened already, and which, uh, more to the point, exemplify things that we know for sure are going to be happening uh, within our lifetimes, uh, not just within our children's lifetimes, unless you're awfully old, I guess, uh, but within our lifetimes, and certainly within our children's lifetimes, an increase in deadly heat waves and uh, more intense precipitation events, including even more intense uh, snowstorms, thanks to the increased uh, uh, moisture content of the atmosphere. And finally, ecological collapses. Here's an image of bark beetles. This is actually a picture I took up in um, the Wind River Range. But those of you who came over Berthet Pass will have noticed a lot of reddish or grayish trees uh, from the uh, Colorado, epic, uh, Colorado epidemic of pine bark beetles. And finally, uh, another type of image that is often presented and which I think should always be presented in uh, presentations like this to show that uh, it's not all gloom and doom. Uh, work is underway, work can be underway, and we can uh, present a more positive and hopeful future uh, through existing and uh, prospective technologies. Thank you.